Rise and shine history buffs. This is the Monday Morning General Podcast, where we give you the play-by-play analysis of battles from antiquity to the 20th century. I'm Brendan, that's Bjorn, and joining us again to finish up this naval campaign of the Spanish Armada is our buddy Steve. It's good to have you back, Steve. Yeah, so... <laughs> Jump right into it, Bjorn. Jeez, Brendan. <laughs> just, just going for it. All right. All right, well, hey, so if you remember from last week, we discussed the preparations, the actions that led up to the battle, uh, or in this case, the series of battles. Out of that discussion last week, there were a couple of things that really stood out to me as being super noteworthy and a little bit ridiculous. Number one, the dude who was selected to lead the Armada had almost no naval experience whatsoever. Didn't even really know how to sail, so... I thought that was a pretty stupid move by the king to put this guy in charge. Especially with a guy who I don't know how to do having... Navy stuff. He says that. Multiple... Please don't. Please don't choose me. I don't yeah. know what I'm doing. Oh, you'll be great. You're very humble. All right. And then <laughs> another thing. Yeah. Super... Oh, he's just super <laughs> humble. Oh, he just has no idea what he's doing. And he's yeah. being honest about it. <laughs> but another thing that was crazy for me is how long the Spanish took to prepare for their invasion. They basically used up or allowed to rot all the supplies before they even got within range of the English coast. Super dumb. And also shout out to the raw green barrels as a major reason for food spoilage. I thought that was pretty sweet. Another reminder that sometimes seemingly small and insignificant actions have huge ripple effects. Like all their food went bad. Why? Because their good seasoned barrels were destroyed in the last raid. And then lastly, I thought that it was really ridiculous. The Spanish plan was like, hey, let's throw a dice and let's hope that the pips fall on the winning number. We're just we're just going to throw it against the wall and see what happens. Yeah. Well, they weren't you know, rolling the dice. God was on their side. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's what we it was. A, okay. So it, it wasn't it was dice, a loaded it was dice. Good. Yeah, it was yeah. loaded. Oh, nice. They had I a like confident it. hope in a I miracle like from the All Catholic right. God. So everything's good here. Ah, yeah, so. Perfect. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Okay. Thanks yeah. for setting me straight on that one, boys. All right. So <laughs> when we left off last week, the Spanish ships had suffered from a storm. They had to return to Spanish held territory to refit. Uh, we have desperate pleas for more ships and provisions after the costly storm. But Philip II insists that the invasion proceeds. On July 21st, the fleet finally departs uh, after wasting precious time sitting in port. So Two months after leaving Lisbon, the proud armada finally sights England on July 29th when it appeared off of the Lizard uh, in Cornwall. And for those of you who are interested, the Lizard is the most southerly point on the British mainland. So I had to look that up. Uh, The armada was spotted and the beacons were lit, notifying Gondor, I mean, notifying London of the attack. The tide prevented the English ships from leaving Plymouth Harbor. The English are not able to respond here. As soon as the Spanish ships come in, everyone's like, oh, shoot, we're stuck in port because the water's coming in. As the tide turned, 55 English ships set out to confront the Armada from Plymouth under the command of Lord Howard of Effingham, with Sir Francis Drake as the vice admiral, and the rear admiral was Sir John Hawkins. All right, the action on Plymouth, which breaks on the dawn of July 31st, English Navy finds himself facing the Spanish Armada near the Eddystone Rocks off Plymouth. So Plymouth is just east outside of Cornwall, and the Eddystone Rocks are about 14 miles southwest of Plymouth as the Raven flies. The English fleet had gained the weather gauge on the Spanish and apparently thus had the advantage. Steve, what is the weather gauge? Uh, When you're talking about sailing ships and sailing combat, weather gauge typically refers to having wind at your back. So the ship with the weather gauge is closest, is, is, is... windward of the ships who do not have the weather Mm. gauge the advantage well there's an advantage and a disadvantage to the weather gauge and depending on your tactics you may prefer one or the other but uh, the weather gauge typically allows uh, the the person uh, the commander holding the weather gauge to dictate the terms of combat uh, because they can uh, choose how they want to maneuver the flip side is that if you do not have the weather gauge you're in a position where you might be more able to retreat from the combat. So it's going to be hard for someone to, it's easiest to sail with the wind. It's difficult to sail against the wind. So if you're sailing towards the enemy with the wind at your back, you're going to have maneuverability, 
dictate how the combat is going to play out. If you are uh, trying to run from the enemy, then if you have the wind at your back, then it's easier for you Got it. to okay. retreat. One thing, the one thing I had read, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, Steve, is the Spanish had these large square sails, and they didn't have a lot of the sailing technology to like sail like into the wind or sail like, like against the wind. Whereas the English had more of that type of capability. So they were able, what, what's the term? They're able to cut back and forth across the wind if they're facing, tack. yeah, attack. If they're facing, if they don't have the weather gauge. So the English can are more maneuverable when they don't have the weather gauge. The Spanish almost need the weather gauge for them to do any sort of maneuvering because they have to have the wind behind them. And at this part of the battle, Medina Sidonia and the Spanish Armada were vastly out of position here against the English who had moved in, out, coming out of Plymouth to take advantage of where the weather was, correct? I think that might be part of it. The Spaniards had a lot of these hulks. Uh, it's a type of medieval, these these transport ships, so it probably didn't have a lot of maneuverability. Very slow, that's part of the reason why it took them so long to get out of Lisbon. They also, though, had these aliases that were rowed that could be moved independent of okay. the wind, which is important to their tactics later on in this engagement, not necessarily this date, but in in their engagements with the English in the channel, uh, they try to use that uh, to work against the weather gauge. Okay, so English had the weather gauge. The Spanish fleet was arrayed in a moon-shaped defensive line with the curve of the line facing eastward. Their large galleons and the major ships were positioned in the middle and at the tips of this curve formation providing protection to the cargo and supply ships that were nestled within the crescent. And then on the other side, the English had split their forces into two groups. To the north was Drake, commanding his ship, the Revenge, and a fleet of 11 other ships. And then to the south was Howard, helming the Ark Royal, or Royal, and leading most of the English fleet. So, knowing that the Spanish excelled in close combat, or were more geared towards that type of combat, the English opted for a different strategy here. They stayed out of grappling range and launched cannonballs from afar. However, this tactic proved less effective due to the distance. So they're still a little too far away for their cannonballs to actually do much damage here. And then so by the end of the first day, neither side had lost any ships. And then after a full day of sailing, the English fleet managed to catch up with their Spanish counterparts. The, the Spanish are recorded to having been very surprised at the English tactics and were uh, surprised at the agility of the English ships. This is their first kind of time seeing these ships in action. And it's just new to them. How is this going to play out? Is and that right, though? The because English, like on the flip side, they've were... been getting like all this privateer activity, like for the last 10 to 15 years, and, you know, Drake coming into Cadiz. So like they, they're aware of how the English fight on the water, right? Or was there like some new developments right up before this engagement? Oh, these race built ships, race built galleons are relatively new. And not everybody who was in the Armada had necessarily mm. engaged with the sure. English before. I mean, there's probably some knowledge of the tactics, but privateering tactics might be very different than you know, traditional naval combat tactics. I, I'm okay. not sure on that note, but in this regard, they expected them to get in and grapple. And the English were fine with just heading them off. On the flip side, though, English uh, were very impressed with the excellent good order of the Spanish fleet. The, the Spanish ships were able to communicate and maneuver effectively with each other overall. And, and we have to look at this and say, what was the English tactic in this battle? They're trying to prevent the Spanish from landing at Plymouth. They don't necessarily know what the Spanish agenda is here. So throughout the engagement with the Spanish in the English Channel, the English are going to fight defensive actions to prevent them from or finding some sort of safe haven on the English coast, right? So they're trying to they're trying to just, like an offensive lineman pass block, just stay away from the quarterback, which is... England. England yeah. proper. Okay. Yeah. And the Spanish are expecting something else. All right. Let's talk about yep. next day. So on August 1st, the English and the Armada found themselves in conflict once more. Uh, this time it's off the coast of Portland. Portland's between Plymouth and the Isle of Wight. A shift in the wind gives the Spanish a weather gauge this time. But their attempts to close in on the English were stymied because those nimble movements of the smaller English ships. As the Spanish fleet adjusts to its lines, the first-rate ship of the line, Nuestra Señora del Rosario, collided with several vessels, losing her bowsprit and triggering a series of calamities. She started drifting away from the fleet and towards the English. Definitely 
not something you want to happen. Uh, it's always a shame when someone on your team yeah. causes a calamity that totally is a hole in your life or causes mass chaos in some way. But here's something that I really liked. So during the night, Drake aboard the Revenge seizes the opportunity, sails up to the Rosario, captures it. And so along with the Admiral and his crew, the English found much needed gunpowder and 50,000 gold ducats. A gold ducat, for those who are interested in coin collecting, all two is a uh, 3.5 gram. <laughs> yep, all two of us. It's a, a This is impressive. It's a 3.5 gram gold coin. So that's 6,172 ounces of gold, or about 386 pounds worth of gold. Today's current value of gold, we have $11.6 million on one this, ship. That's a good find. That is a great find. So I have two points on this. The first thing, Drake is always a privateer, right? This dude is hunting for cash. Uh, he's going to find the treasure. That's like, all he cares about. So that's the first point. Just remember, like, the English are like, they have this privateering mindset piece. And then the second piece is the amount of gold that the Spanish just have with them. Like, I get you're conducting, like, this large-scale military operation, and you're going to need some sort of resources to pay for supplies, pay to get your ships prepared, grease some wheels politically if you need to do that. Um, but a lot of the... Pay your pay man. Your man. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. But I think a lot of it was just, we're nobles, and this is what you know, fancy boys do. We bring our money with us everywhere. Uh, a lot of guys drown because they're so heavy, because they have their coins sewed into their clothing, and it weighs them down. Like, they're basically wearing a suit of armor because they have so much gold that's just interwoven into the fabrics of their clothing uh, that they can't swim. It's nuts. They just have so all so, this money laying around. That's crazy. What's interesting is earlier in the action off of Plymouth, the San Salvador ship was damaged. It blew up. It's There are conflicting stories as to what happened, but the end result is there was a huge fire. It was a big explosion, and they had to get all hands to try to put out the fire. And the reason that's important is because that ship had all the Armada's pay in gold on it. And so Sidonia, Medina Sidonia, has all of the gold on the San Salvador transferred. But when the Rosario is damaged, they abandon the ship. They don't scuttle it. Again, like a naval commander might have considered scuttling the ship instead of letting it potentially fall into English hands. And they also didn't take the ducats off. They didn't take any of the powder, the ammunition, gifts, or other supplies. Like they were bejeweled swords that they were going to give to like noblemen in England and all that kind of stuff. And so there's just like a sort of a tactical blunder here on the Spanish part when what do you do with this damaged ship? The other point on this that I also want to point out is that Drake captures this thing, but it's a controversial effect because he was tasked with guiding the English fleet. And in the middle of the night, his lantern went out and other ships in the fleet, Howard's ships to be specific, tried to follow him and thought they saw a light in the distance. And when dawn came up, they were very close to the Spanish fleet with Drake nowhere to be found. Drake tells a story that he thought he saw the Spanish fleet, so he shut off his lantern. And then, you know, as dawn broke, he was just so fortuitous to be near this Rosario wreck. Most of the English privateers were like, oh, uh, jolly good fortune, sir. Except for one other ship who tried to get the Rosario earlier that day. And this captain is just pissed yeah. because he wanted that yeah. for himself. And Drake snuck in the middle of night and grabbed it. That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, the, the story is a little bit more detailed, but to save time, we won't have to go into all of it right now. Okay. So next, the Armada hopes to establish a temporary base in the Solent. Uh, it's a strait that separates the Isle of Wight from the English mainland. They plan to wait there for updates from Parma's army, but the English attacked in full force, breaking into four groups. Frobisher, commanding the ship Aid, led one squadron while Drake approached with a substantial force from the south. Sidonia, realizing the danger, orders reinforcements and directed the Armada back to the open sea, and the Armada was forced to head for Calais, unable to wait for Parma's news. So this kind of sets us up to move them closer into the French coast. On August 7th, the Armada anchors off Calais in a tightly packed defensive crescent formation. Uh, Parma's army is reduced by disease to 16,000. 
was supposed to be waiting there. But guess what? They weren't ready. The transport boats are, are supposed to be protected as they cross the channel by the Armada. But in order for that to occur, they'd have to cross into Dutch waters. And here's the thing. Apparently, no one thought that this would have to happen. No one thought it was going to be a problem, but it becomes a huge problem. So as Medina Sidonia uh, awaited at anchor, Dunkirk, the area that he's at, is blockaded by a Dutch fleet of 30 flyboats under Lieutenant Admiral Justinius van Nassau. The Dutch flyboats mainly operated in the shallow waters off Zeeland and Flanders, where larger warships with deeper draft, uh, like the Spanish and English galleons, could not safely enter. So here we are. The Spanish Armada has found itself in conflict with yet another fleet, not the English fleet, but a Dutch fleet. Now, the crazy thing about Calais, if you go and look at the map, there is no safety there. There's no, like, the port area is really small. I don't know if you can even get any ship, like, bigger, any of these bigger ships in there. And so all of the <laughs> Spanish Armada is just sitting in the English Channel, in the open water, uh, no protection at all. And they just have to sit there. They're, most, most of them are anchored. Most of them are double anchored because the current was pretty strong and the ground under the channel is very soft sand. And so it's hard for the anchors to catch on anything. Uh, so they like tended to drift. So they needed two anchors to keep the ships in place. Uh, so that's where, they're, that's where they're sitting. And then in the middle of the night, uh, between August 7th and 8th, the English set alight eight fire ships, sacrificing warships by filling them with pitch, brimstone, gunpowder, and tar, and sends them downwind among the closely anchored vessels of the Armada. The Spanish feared that these uncommonly large fire ships were hell burners, uh, specialized fire ships filled with large gunpowder charge. Oh, a bunch of the commanders of the English fleet had volunteered up their ships to be these fire ships. I think most of them were picked because they were old ships and they would actually get paid by the crown for volunteering their ships to be these fire ships. So I think a lot, you know, guys like Drake and Howard and Frobisher and some of these guys were offering up their ships to get them money to refit newer ships or buy newer ships so that they could just get rid of this old stuff out of their fleet. Okay, so three of these ships were intercepted by Patashas and towed away, uh, but the remainder of them bore down on the fleet. So this is one of those scenarios where you look at it initially and you're like, they took eight ships, they lit them on fire, and they sent them down towards the Spanish. They're going to miss every Spanish ship. No damage is going to yep. be done. Uh, the English are minus eight ships. And you're like, what a terrible waste. And, and then you realize, remember, it's these small things that you don't realize are important until after mm -hmm. the event has happened. Because although Medina Sidonia's flagship and some of the principal warships hold their position, the rest of the fleet cuts their anchor cables and scatter in confusion. Like they're not raising anchor. They're cutting them. And that is going to be a huge part in some of the latter actions that happen to the Spanish Armada. Uh, but like I said, ships are going to be burnt. The crescent formation is broken. The fleet's scattered. They find themselves too far away uh, to return to Calais. And so they're going to have to make some maneuvers in order to try and recover from this surprise attack. On this note, what's interesting is that Medina Sonia actually sent out a messenger to be sure the order to slip anchors was received. And at the same time, he summoned all the captains to his ship for a war council. Uh, this was at the early hours of August 8th after these fire ships have been run and terror is slipping the fleet and everyone's trying to leave. Uh, most of the captains refused the order to come aboard his ship for a council. I don't know why they didn't tow more of them away because there was only eight. They towed three away. And you would imagine that they were expecting the English to do this, right? They, like, they knew that the English were keen to use these fire ships, and why didn't they have more folks ready to tow these fire ships out of? Maybe maybe it was just difficult to get to them. They are exploding with, like, gunpowder and cannon. I think they had also, like, loaded up the cannon on the fire ships with cannonballs so that they would, like, sail into the fleet and then explode just super close range. So maybe, like, they are scared of it, but it's like, should have had some more towboats out there or something. Man, what a waste well, of cannons. Cannons are really expensive. That night, uh, there was a westerly wind, meaning the wind is coming out of the west. Um, so the fire ships have the wind at their back, and they were the fires weren't lit until the ships were about 15 minutes out from the first Spanish target. So the ships only had 15 minutes to maneuver in the middle of the night. They probably had 
a full watch complements standing, but still to maneuver and get around if you're only on wind power and the wind is uh, with the fire ships, you don't have much time. So that that's probably why they weren't able to catch all of the fire okay. ships. All right. So before dawn on August 8th, Medina Sidonia struggles to regather his fleet after the fire ship scattered him. He's reluctant to sail further east than the Spanish port of Gravelines. I think it's England. Gravelines. I think it's the French pronunciation of it. Ah, yeah. Gravelines. Gravelines yeah. All right. At least according right. to this really we'll random YouTube video I watched. <laughs> it sounds cool, though. <laughs> All right, we'll go with oh, it. So one other note, before, before we move into that, we talked about how Drake did his privateering uh, against the Rosario. Same thing happened here. You know, the English are all sitting, like, you know, Lord Howard of Effingham is, like, sitting out there with his, his you know, telescope or whatever he's looking at. I don't, I don't know if they even have those, you know, sighting, sighting scopes yet. But, like, they're just waiting to see this, you know, hellish sight in front of them where all the Spanish ships start on fire. And all the English see are eight English ships drift slowly into the beach at Calais. And so they're just sitting there burning. But in this confusion, all these cables getting cut and the Spanish fleet departing, a ship does run aground near Calais. And the admiral of the fleet, Lord Howard of Effingham, sees his opportunity. And so he sails down there to take care of this one single ship while the rest of the Spanish Armada is going away so the admiral of the fleet gets into the privateering action to go in see what he can do to take his treasure he actually doesn't take any treasure there's a little fighting uh, that happens so it actually doesn't really work out very good for him i just thought it was extremely hilarious that howard decides to take the flagship of the fleet and go chase down one spanish galleon for one of the main things with regard to naval tactics is if you capture a ship you're entitled so Throughout a lot of the Age of Sail, if you captured an enemy ship, you actually got to petition with it for for the uh, the amount of money, and then you would receive a prize from your government for the capturing of that ship. And there's a lot of serious money to be made in the Navy, whereas in the Army back in the day, you didn't make nothing. Yeah. Well, with, with the San Lorenzo, the ship that ran aground. Oh, the, yeah, that one, okay. Yeah, yeah, another English ship actually went after it, the Margaret and John another privateer, and she ran aground. And uh, the reason that the English weren't able to completely pillage the Galeas, the, the San Lorenzo, was because the French sent troops to defend the ship. When they the, had the yeah. legal precedence to own it then because it was in a French so, port. And the French didn't like the English yeah. so much at this time. And so the Kelly Castle was like, uh, we'll just blow you guys up if you don't get out of here. Some of the English also treated the French as enemies, and they started taking away the Frenchmen's rings and jewels and goodies. And so the French returned to shore complaining, and that resulted in the fort opening fire. Oh, and so the English had to retreat and were not able to capture their prize. Oh my God. So remember, this is dawn, August 8th. Medina Sedona is gathering his ships together again from having been scattered. Uh, they're going into their traditional crescent formation. The English fleet moves in, and at dawn, the Spanish flagship with four others find themselves out of line and facing the entire English fleet. This is definitely not something that you want to find yourself facing. Uh, so the English provoke the Spanish fire while staying out of range like normal. The English then close, firing broadsides into the enemy ships. All right, the English stay on the windward side of the ship. So they're, the healing armada hulls are exposed to damage before the waterline, uh, and then when they change course, they get waterlogged. So does that mean that the sail, so the wind's pushing the ship and it's like leaning? And so when it's leaning, the English are firing their cannonballs in what would be underneath the waterline because of the ship's lean? Is that how that works? Uh, yeah, depending on how the ships are maneuvering, if you have two ships uh, that are parallel to each other in the same course and the wind is blowing you know, perpendicular to those ships, then the windward ship is going to heal in the direction the wind is blowing and so will the leeward ship. But that means the guns on the, the ship with the weather gauge are going to be pointing down and the guns on the point, the ship without the weather gauge are going to be pointing up. And so in that situation, the English would be able to shoot lower into the hulls of the Spanish ships 
and the Spanish would be probably forced to shoot higher into, say, the upper decks or the rigging of an English ship. But uh, that being said, ships are rocking, and uh, ships are designed with a writing moment, so they're going to they're gonna roll back and forth. And so depending on your tactics and depending on how the weather is and how you're maneuvering, that ideal situation might not always come into play, although it might be more probable than not. But the English in general wanted to try to shoot low. And at this point in the battle, we didn't really cover it, but the, the several days in between the Battle of Gravelines and the first contact, there were lots of skirmishes going on, and the English were fighting this defensive pass-blocking action uh, from a distance, harassing the Spanish, and they were really running out of supplies. Not food, but ammo, uh, gunpowder in particular. And so they were trying to get resupplies from the uh, English mainland, and they were being challenged to get everything they needed. They were actually taking some of the gunpowder they were getting from these Spanish prizes they captured um, and using that to fuel their cannons. And so by this point in the engagement, Lord Howard says, we don't have enough gunpowder to keep fighting these long distance engagements. We're going to get up close and personal and we're going to take it to them. And they were prepared to get into this uh, hand-to-hand grappling type of combat. Now, as the story would go, uh, they don't have to butt they are able to maneuver and they make the tactical decision to get in close and fire broadsides very close together with the intent to board if necessary uh, because they just don't have the ammo anymore to to fight the way they've been fighting. I want to I want to read off a paragraph from a confident hope in America because I think Neil Hansen does a great job of describing how the initial uh, part of this battle starts. So battle commenced around nine in the morning as the Revenge, that's Drake's ship, closed on the San Martin both held their fire until they were no further than a half musket shot or even an arquebus shot apart, well under 100 yards and perhaps as close as 50. At last, the Revenge fired her bow guns and then her broadsides and took the San Martin's broadside in return, being pierced through with cannonballs of all sizes which were flying everywhere between the two fleets and was riddled with every kind of shot. But her own fire had wrecked far greater damage on her foe. The lighter weapons on the deck and upper gun deck pulverized the upper works of the San Martin, chain and bar shots shredding rigging sails, spars, and yards, while dice and hail shore wreaked terrible havoc among the close-packed soldiers lining the rails to discharge their small arms. Meanwhile, the heavier cannon on the Revenge lower gun decks, close to the waterline, battered the San Martin's hull. Even its four-inch oak planking and close-packed timbers could not withstand such an onslaught from 30 and 60-pound shot fired at a close range, so close that smoldering powder residue and spin wadding drifted over the enemy decks like snow. Already weakened by the previous battles, the hull was pierced by shot, still glowing and smoking from the furnace on the cannon. Smashing through the planking, each ball unleashed a blizzard of arrow-sharp splinters and shards of oak, filling the air like a swarm of murderous hornets, ripping, stabbing, blinding, maiming, and shredding flesh from bone, and driven with such force that some jagged shards embedded themselves in the planking, of the opposite hull, quivering like thrown knives. Well, there, there you go. Goes. That's how it looks like most of this battle is the English come in from the bow side, fire their bow guns, and then turn the broadside, and then you know, try to turn uh, in them on, on the other. The English had fired cannons like one shot every hour, and then the Spanish were only doing like a shot a day from a cannon. And the other interesting thing that I was reading about here, too, is the cannons aren't what I was thinking with, like, later cannon in the Age of Sail, where they would be recoil reloaded, right? So the cannon would recoil, and they'd pack, you know, they'd, they'd load it from inside the ship. It's hard to tell here, but there are some, like, tapestries and other images that show these ships with men hanging over the sides of the ship and reloading the cannon from the side of the ship. That's not good. That's not good. That is not good. That is not good. So many of the Spanish gunners are going to be killed and wounded by these English mm-hmm. broadsides. So as one more gunner dies, you have to replace him with someone else. And so we get all these foot soldiers who are unpracticed. They can become less effective. Uh, a couple hours into this battle, some more Armada warships are going to come up to reinforce those who are already engaged. But the fight lasts around eight hours. Uh, the English ships begin to run out of ammunition like Steve was talking about. And some of the gunners begin loading objects such as chains into their cannons, anything they can find. You know, like in Pirates of the Caribbean, they got spoons and stuff. 
So around 4 p.m., the English fired their last shots. They're going to pull back. Uh, and we're going to see five Spanish and one Portuguese ship are going to be lost in the battle with others being significantly damaged. Well, I was just going to comment on the gunnery tactics here. The English had uh, the truckle carriages, but the Spanish still had muzzleloading cannons and they had an awkward uh, large wheeled mounting on long trails. I'm just going to read a little bit from Robert Hodgson's Spanish Armada and the, the kind of paraphrase here. But the Spanish cannons weren't really optimized for being used at sea. And so the size of the carriage for the cannons required them to be pulled back and reloaded in a diagonal position. You, you have pictures in your mind of the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? The cannons recoil, yep. you load them up, and you roll them back out. The Spanish had to roll them and pivot them inside their hull. which Or the alternative to doing that maneuver is what you talked about, mm-hmm. the side. And so neither one of those is going to be advantageous uh, for a battle. And what's interesting in the way the Spanish crewed their guns was that they had uh, to have six people and had six soldiers drawn from those who were uh, chosen to fire muskets from the mast tops or on the main deck. And so once a gun was ready to fire, they would return to their sniper duties and then they'd have to be called back down to reload the cannon after it's what? been fired. They're so, just running all over the place. Yeah, that doesn't. they're just running all over the place or they're like not going down to reload the cannon or the the idea was not that you'd be doing these uh, rapid reload maneuvers yeah. you'd load the cannon maybe once and then you go and you grapple and you bore yep okay. yep and your primary duty is to be a sniper not to be a cannon reloader hmm. the the spanish cannonades failed to inflict serious injury on the queen's ships and they know this because there's evidence that the cost of repairs to the queen's ships before the fighting was far more expensive than the cost afterwards. Speaking of the queen here, uh, <laughs> let's talk about her for a second. So she's visiting 4,500 militiamen who had assembled to defend the Thames estuary uh, from a potential Spanish advance. So they haven't heard any news from these battles. These dudes are prepared to sell their lives dearly. And so Elizabeth shows up, she's wearing her beautiful ceremonial armor, trying to give the idea that she's actually you know, a king would ride into a battle, but she's a queen. And so she has to be this it's a very interesting relationship that she has with her soldiers. So she gives this rousing speech real quick here. Since we're all reading, I guess I'll read something too. Mine's actually a primary source though. So I this is a primary read. source. All right. So she says, my loving people, we have been persuaded by some that are careful to of our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. But I do assure you, I do not desire to live to distrust my faithful and loving people. Let tyrants fear. I have always so behaved myself that under God, I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore, I am come amongst you as you see at this time, not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of battle to live or die amongst you all to lay down for my God and for my kingdoms and for my people, my honor and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and of a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Parma of Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which rather than any dishonor should grow by me, I myself will take up arms I myself will be your general, judge, and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. I know already for your forwardness, you have deserved rewards and crowns. And we do assure you on the word of a prince that they shall be duly paid you. In the meantime, my lieutenant general shall be in my stead. Then whom never prince commanded a more noble or worthy subject, nor doubting by your obedience to my general, By your concord in the camp and your valor in the field, we shall shortly have a famous victory over these enemies of my God, of my kingdom, and of my people. I'm I'm, I'm here to fight amongst you, but in my stead will be my general. Yep, yep. I'm here to die with you, but my general will lead and I'll not be here. Oh, man. (laughs) This is just political theater (laughs) is all the speeches. The speech of Tilbury. I like it. I thought it was... I was about ready to say huzzah and, and attack the Spanish. Oh, man. Good stuff by the queen there. 
Okay, so let's just like in in general just talk about some of the tactics. The opposing forces here are experienced in completely different fighting styles, right? Uh, we can study the Spanish style from uh, like the Battle of Lepanto. And like we said, they want to fire one cannon volley. They want to ram and grapple to take the enemy ships, board, engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. While the English on the other side, they wanted to take advantage of the wind and line-to-line -line cannon fire from windward, which exposed the opponent's ship hulls and rudders as targets. And the rudders are really important, right? Because if you don't have a rudder, you can't maneuver your ship at all. Uh, they don't want to board. Uh, up until this point, the cannon had played a supporting role to the main tactic of ramming and boarding ships. And the failure of the Spanish Armada vindicated the English strategy and started this revolution in naval tactics of long-range, accurate cannon fire on on naval ships. And that can all come back to this this battle here at Gravelina, uh, really showing off the English ability to damage Spanish so I just want to illustrate like the panic that had gone into this, uh, this come across the Spanish fleet over that battle. Um, overnight, like we said, they only lost four vessels. They had over a thousand killed and 800 people wounded across the fleet. So the ships that were heavy in combat were really beat up. Um, and so the morale up and down the chain of command sunk severely overnight, despite remaining a clearly a formidable military force. And so some of the Armada captains started, suggested surrender and they were stuck between the English fleet and the coast with the risk of wrecking on the Flanders banks, which we discussed. And so during this time, the leadsmen are taking frequent soundings, which is dropping a line down to the bottom of the ocean and reading the depth in that line. And as they pull these up, they are getting shallower and shallower and shallower. And one of the members of the Captain General staff, Luis de Miranda, says, we saw ourselves lost or taken by the enemy or the whole armada drowned upon the banks. It was the most fearful day in the world for the whole company had lost all hope of success and looked only for death. At a depth of seven fathoms or about 12.8 meters, let's just say, what is that, 36 feet? It's a little bit more than that, but 40 feet. So Medina Sidonia says to his advisors, what should we do? Are we lost? And... Uh, some of the men said back, uh, this is O Quendo, as for me, I will fight and die like a man, so send me a supply of shot. It, they believe that God alone could rescue us, which he did when the winds changed and they were able to sail north and avoid the shoals, which they could see the white water of them along the horizon. So I just wanted to cap that was a very fearful loss of control moment, like what's going to happen to us, uh, and suddenly God provides us way to get all of this. And you can imagine the relief in the Spanish as they are like, oh, we finally don't have to, to worry about getting pinched on these rocks, and we finally have an out, and that going into their already panicked and tired decision-making from days of lack of sleep, making this decision to say, yeah, let's just go home, let's go north around England, that can't be as bad as what we're in right now. On the day after the Battle of Gravelines, the disorganized and unmaneuverable Spanish fleet was at risk of running onto the sands of Zealand because of prevailing wind. Uh, the wind then changes to the south, enables the fleet to sail north. The English ships under Howard pursue to prevent any landing on English soil, because I think that's their number one goal. So obviously, you don't want to ruin, you don't want to sink someone's ship to the bottom of the ocean. You want to capture it. You want to then incorporate it into mm -hmm. your fleet. That's why Portuguese ships are a part of yep. your fleet in the Spanish Armada. But at the same time, uh, England's number one goal is to ensure that the Spanish do not land on English soil. And so he's going to follow him. On August 12th, Howard's going to call a halt to the pursuit at the latitude of the 5th of 4th uh, off of Scotland. The only option left for the Spanish ships at this point in time is to sail around the north side of Scotland and go home via the Atlantic or through the Irish Sea, uh, which really seems like, at this point, I think we don't quite understand how limiting wind is as a factor. Like, it's blowing one way, so that's the way you're going to go, or a couple variations of that way. There was some discussions amongst so, the admirals of the Spanish fleet to try to run the channel again, and this time try to go from easterly to westerly. The wind never really gives them the chance to do that, um, and they eventually get pushed too far north where they just kind of have to commit, because they are desperately running out of food and water they have like almost no supplies left and so they they can't wait around for another miracle wind to push them west and i think you know this and that's to the point where howard gets to the point on the 12th vog we don't need to pursue them anymore They're, they have they don't have an opportunity now to do any swing around back into the channel and at that point howard was also running out of victuals and food and ammunition so he needed to go and refuel and refit within 
within England and bring the fleet back and get everything set up to prevent another landing. Um, we've talked about these battles. We've had fire ships. We've had, you know, broadsides. Mm -hmm. We've had all this fighting for days. And as the Spanish fleet rounds Scotland on the 20th of August, it consists of 110 vessels. So we've only actually lost five, six, yep. seven ships throughout the entirety of the actual combat. But here's the thing. The Spanish ships are beginning to show real wear from this mm -hmm. long voyage. It shouldn't have been as long as it was, right. uh, but they kept together. They strengthened their damage hull with cables. The supplies of water and food's going to run short. This fleet off of Scotland and Ireland, they're going to run into a series of powerly westerly winds. It's going to drive many of the damaged ships further toward the lee shore. Many of the anchors had been abandoned during their escape from the English fire ships off Calais, and so many of the ships are going to be incapable of securing shelter as the fleet reached the coast of Ireland and were driven onto the rocks. So, so mainland Europe had been awaiting news of the Armada all summer. Reports of Spanish victories spreading in hopes of convincing Pope Sextus V to release his promise of one million ducats upon landing of troops. A Spanish victory was incorrectly celebrated in Paris, Prague and Venice. Not until late August that a reliable report of the Spanish defeat arrived in major cities and were widely believed. So I wanted to real quick go back to Parma. Remember, he's hanging out in northern France. The dude's just going to mess around up there for a little while. He's going to break his army into three different ways. And every one of his endeavors is going to be completely rebuffed. Uh, by the campaign's conclusion, his army is going to suffer more than 10,000 casualties. And then in England, Elizabeth orders her army disbanded. The camp at Tilbury, which we had just read her speech from, dissolves five days later. She discharges the Navy. She sends them home without pay. Uh, all the while, the costs of this defensive effort are mounting, total nearly 400,000 pounds, uh, and measures were put in motion to mitigate it. We have to understand that there's typhus, scurvy, dysentery sweeping through the crews, of these naval vessels and also there's disease and starvation that's running rampant in there as well but side note 400,000 pounds is equivalent to about 148 million dollars in today's money so one can understand that she'd be looking at that budgetary item and saying we got to do the, something the story that i had read about this was this is like the most sickening thing about this whole deal the treasurer for the crown when hearing about the crews dying from the diseases was happy because it's like oh then we don't got to pay them yeah Elizabeth like did not what well, she was very close-fisted and did not pay anybody anything her speech sounded Once, like she was ready to participate just about but they're like the spanish just well, sailed away there's yeah, no the need to pay anybody because of that it's like tipping somebody at the yeah, buffet and the english are broke like yeah. we talked about the first episode so they don't have any money the other interesting thing around the pay and the deaths at sea was a lot of times in this era, and the Spanish did this and the English did this, so some of our records aren't completely accurate, um, is when sailors died, they didn't record them as having died until a much later date with the intent of keeping them on the payroll longer. Uh, so when they come back to collect their money, there would be more pay either for their family, probably unlikely, or, the commander. or for the captain or the yeah. rest of the crew. <laughs> Yeah, uh, to take for themselves. So don't get any move. ideas, Bjorn. I like that. Don't get any books. ideas on that. Uh, that's a really, that's a really good idea. Yeah. Uh, we didn't really talk much about the fate of some of the Spanish ships. A lot of the ships were wrecked off of the English and Irish and Scottish coasts. But uh, when that happened, if you didn't die in the shipwreck and you made it to shore, it was likely that uh, you would be killed by the English or the Irish or the Scottish. Some people were lucky and they were fortunate to be picked up by Catholics who showed them some uh, hospitality and tried to help them. But most of uh, the folks were killed. And if you were seemed to be a noble person or someone who might command a ransom, then you might be kept and put in jail and a letter might be written to your family or your king or your sponsor or whoever to try to get money for you. But for most of the sailors who were not noble people, they were just hung or shot or jailed and left to, to rot and die. Um, so it's for the fate of these sailors, just because you got off your ship and you made it to land, you were still uh, likely to perish. 
there were about five different days of Thanksgiving as more information of the year of the English victory was obtained. So every time they got more information on their victory, they're like, oh, it's a day of Mm. Thanksgiving. Oh, it's a day of Thanksgiving. With the final one, Queen Elizabeth is going to ride a chariot through the streets of London like those Roman emperors doing that. They're celebrating their triumph. Yeah. I mean, she did a lot. She did great things to help ensure that battle. She stood there and gave a good speech. You know, I'm going to say right now, but I'm going to say Spain, right now, MMG hot take. I don't like Queen Elizabeth. Ooh, I mean, that that might be that might be fighting words there. We'll have to have a conversation on that later. <laughs> but in Spain, huh, the news of the disaster brought shock and despair and the nation went into mourning. So you have five different days of Thanksgiving with the English. You've got a nation in mourning with the Spanish. Its defeat was even more devastating because hopes of its success had been raised by false rumors. And so throughout the summer, people would be like, oh, yeah, did you hear we won? Oh, yeah, did you hear we won? And then all of a sudden, uh, it was a devastating loss. The rumors included Drake and Howard being taken prisoner, the Isle of Wight and Plymouth taken, Parma's army approaching London. Those are all rumors that just got people's hopes up. The king is going to take the news really hard. He's going to shut himself away for days. The daily business of government uh, was also brought to an abrupt halt. And the king is known to have claimed, uh, he said, I sent the armada against men, not God's wind and waves. Uh, We don't know exactly how many Spanish individuals lost their lives, but we estimate that roughly one third of the vessels that left Spain that spring was lost. And of the Spanish sailors, 25,600 and 96 men left Coruna, and 13,399 returned for a loss of over 12,300 men. Here are the notes I have from, from Hansen's Confident Hope in a Miracle. At minimum, 40 ships for Spain did not return from the voyage. Another 25 made it back to Spain, but never sailed again. As many as 20,000 or two-thirds of the 30,000 force died in combat with illness or in wrecks. So only a third of them actually survived. For every man killed in combat, another six or eight died from exhaustion, drowning, sepsis, disease, starvation, or thirst. Oh, Bjorn, you're going to like this. So I, I found this little report that, that was in Lisbon that was given out dur- for during a street cry. So this is Portuguese street criers pre- presenting the news that the Spanish Armada failed. Uh, so this is what they said. Which ships got home? The ones English missed. And where are the rest? The waves will tell you. What happened to them? It is said they are lost. Do we know their names? They know them in London. And Hansen says that these Portuguese street vendors must have recited the litany of Spain uh, of Spanish catastrophe with particular relic because uh, they did not like the Spanish. Like, why did this not work for the Spanish? What are you guys' thoughts? Like, why were they not successful at all? Number one, have a leader who knows how to run a navy, how to run a fleet. Uh, number two, don't place all your trust and hope in divine intervention. Like. Maybe yeah. make something happen on your own or at least plan for that something. That was the crazy thing to me is like King Philip had micromanaged this thing to death and gave Medina Sidonia a very you know precise way that he wanted this thing accomplished, which is you know, the one thing we talk about in the yard is like, you don't want to micromanage your leaders, right? You want to give them some guidance. You want to give them the task that they have at hand and then give them the left and right limits and let them figure out the plan for themselves. And Philip does not do that. The, like the one big glaring piece, they he never laid out a plan on how Parma and Medina Sidonia were supposed to link up and actually conduct the crossing. Uh, and there was never any place that that plan was wargamed or discussed or figured out. It was just like, it's going to happen. And we can obviously see that like with the assembly of those those little boats not happening, Parma not being where he needs to be at the right time. Yeah, and then all the delays cause it's so like you can't even have a plan. Like when is Parma supposed to be ready? Because he can't just like, have his guys in boats every day. The Dutch and the English are right there. Yeah, you ha- like you have to. No, and he, yeah, that, that was Parma's argument too. He's like, look, my books are going to be so packed. These guys are going to rot if I put them on there and they have to wait at all. So you have to be ready for me. Give me time to board them uh, and we got to sync up. And so that was part of the frustration on his end. 
Um, because he was also trying to fight a delaying action and not necessarily give a to cross the channel to the English or the Dutch um, because they were ongoing with negotiations and such as well. And so he didn't want to play his hand. I think the other thing that is often talked about with the Spanish Armada is just how misfortunate the Spanish were uh, with the weather they encountered. They really never had winds that were in their favor. They had unexpected storms consistently throughout the whole campaign, both in the channel and on their loop back home. Part of the decision that they, part of the rationale for the decision to loop back home over the northern uh, end of the British Isles was that the weather should still hold for them to make it back without running into the seasonal storms. But that didn't hold true and the storms wrecked the fleet. And so some people think that part of the, just the miss there with the forecasting was due to shifts in weather patterns caused by the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age is a period of maybe 400-ish years from some scholars would say like the 1300s, some people might say the 16th century up to about the mid 19th century. But in any case, that, that period is changing weather patterns and it could be that the forecasting for this particular summer was off due to these climate effects that were going uh, on in Europe at the time. So maybe one of the maxims of war is just be lucky because the Spanish were super unlucky. To me, the biggest, like, I do think, Bjorn, you're right. I think like the planning was just atrocious. But I think the number one thing here is the English are just way further ahead in ship technology. And I think when we talk about why is a battle significant, I think that is one of the things here too is like it was just technologically just showing that accurate long range cannon fire, really maneuverable ships are what win the day for a new transitioning navy. And the Spanish just didn't have that. Like they're they were running ships that were two generations old at that point. And a lot of them couldn't handle the rougher waters of the open Atlantic. They had to have perfect wind. You know, if it was the other way around. You know, if they had better ships, they could have dealt with those wind issues, Steve. Uh, but because they had old ship technology that was built for the med, they just couldn't, uh, they couldn't deal with the bad things that were thrown at them. And then, you know, the English just able to arrange them and just, I think, more proficient at sailing. Drake was a very well-accomplished captain, as well as, you know, guys like Raleigh and Hawkins and Frobisher. Uh, they were very well acquainted with the sea and, like, how to operate navies and the spanish just didn't really have that capability things might have been different under uh, what was the first admiral's name for the spanish valdez maybe things would have been different if he would have lived um instead of and then not have medina sidonia but i think they're just so out they just did not have the technological capability to overcome the english nice brendan i really like the in the significance to military technology and military ideas. I like that. I'm going to take it a little differently. And I'm going to say this thing is significant to history because imagine the Spanish are on their way up. Their sun or their sun has risen. The sun never sets on yeah. the Spanish empire. And then all of a sudden the Spanish are defeated and we a new kid in town and it's the English. And so instead, imagine that the tie, that it was changed. Imagine the Spanish had won. Now what happens? Yeah. Does the sun never set on the British empire? I don't think so. I think that Britain, at this point in time, the significance to history is you're at a fork in the road, left the Spanish win and the Spanish remain the top mm -hmm. dogs in the world, but no, nope, yeah. they turned right and the British take over as the number one nation and empire in the world and they'll be in charge for the next 200 yeah. years. But I think that's a great point, but I think if the stakes weren't so high, for the future of England, this battle wouldn't really be all that significant. It was a stupid tactical and strategic blunder by the Spanish with terrible logistics, a relatively straightforward defensive fight for the yeah. English. Defend your homeland, don't let them land, and the Spanish don't want to land. So it, it went the way it probably should have, minus the weather. And it's just the idea that if they had somehow been able to connect this Hail Mary pass and land Parma on England, that England would have been capitulated, I think is what just is the, is the romantic sense yeah. that people capture with this fight. And that's a huge part too, Steve, because 
This wasn't the only Spanish no. Armada. After this, there's the English Armada that tries to go it to Spain, miserably. and then you've got another Spanish Armada. You have another Spanish Armada, and then another Spanish Armada after that. If this truly was significant, why would there be three other Armadas that set sail within the next 15 to 20 years? So maybe you have mm-hmm. a point there, Steve. And like you said, they don't necessarily seem to learn from their mistakes in hindsight, but you have to keep in mind that at the time, they don't have the ability to build a brand new fleet no. with all modern ships that doesn't have any rot or decay, that has competent commanders who have been trained, competent crews, all this kind of stuff. Like They're taking what they've got at the time that they can throw into the fight. You go to war with the army um, you have. They don't have ships that... And they don't have ships that can last for a decade or two decades with without major repairs yeah. and underfitting or retrofitting and stuff. So it's challenging to kind of Monday morning general this one and say, oh, what they should have done or what they could have done without trying to put yourself in the shoes and say they, they were doing the best with what they had, we're, which wasn't a lot. Did they do the best, though? Like, I oh, the English, oh, the English did. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, the English, the leaders in general are trying to make decisions with what they know. Philip, we can crap on him all day, but he wasn't a naval guy. And he knew that if he could break England, he saw the hole in their defenses, the chink in their armor, that if he could get this miracle off, it would it would really be great for him. So he's willing to take the gamble, yeah. right, from his perspective. And, and ultimately, the interesting thing is what ultimately happens is they come to a negotiation, and the terms of the negotiation are pretty much what the Spanish uh, were going to go and ask for. The English retreated from uh, the Dutch. There were some reparations paid, and there was the Spanish lost the Netherlands too, though. For a short period of time, this is when Prince William of Orange <clears throat> takes over the Netherlands, and so it becomes the Netherlands become independent after this. Okay, but the goal of pushing England off of the European mainland yeah. is achieved, but because England also wants to. Philip leave. does not put a son on the they English just don't have throne, a way to do it. and that's what he wanted. And he failed to do that because mm-hmm. he did not plan very well. He sucked at planning logistics. He sucked at planning maneuver. He sucked at planning military stuff. It, and he really, as the king, shouldn't have been planning no. any of it. And the guy that should have figured it out died. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, yeah, it seemed like there was probably a lot of like a sunk cost thing. It's like we built up the armada, so we got to use it now. When in reality, they might have been better served to have not done the armada. But, anyways, I think that's sure. It. If you have the, the you have the religious tensions yeah. there too, right? The Catholic Church, the Pope, as stingy as he is, he's willing to create a funding mechanism yeah. because he would love to take a chance at shutting down the Protestants in England as well, right? And so the Irish, and so there's these movements that really are going to do whatever it takes because they feel like they're back to a corner and their belief system is threatened yeah. as well. So you can understand why they did what they did, even though it was illogical and maybe short-sighted. Maybe we'll talk about the religious tensions on our sister podcast, Monday Morning Pope. Uh, which <laughs> Anyway, okay. I think we're going to call it here, guys. Spanish Armada. Is that our children's podcast? Yeah. Yeah, Spanish Armada. It was a failure. It didn't work. And then England rose out of the ashes of the Spanish Armada. All right. That's all we got. Bjorn, got any other last comments here before we wrap it up? No, I don't have anything for you all. Thanks for the opportunity to indulge me. This was yeah. my choice, the Spanish Armada. So now I think, Brendan, I think it's yeah. your choice to make a selection. Uh, so tell us all about right. it. We are going to move up to the 1800s, and we're going to talk about Napoleon Bonaparte and the Battle of Austerlitz, the Battle of the Three Emperors. So this one's going to be fun. Oh, and... Perfect, Perfect timing. Timing. The movie's coming out. Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing Ridley Scott's Napoleon movie, and it kind of gave me the inspiration to want to talk about some Napoleon stuff. I think a lot of people are going to talk about Waterloo. I want to talk about probably Napoleon's most famous, significant victory that he had at the Battle of Austerlitz. So I look forward to talking about that with you. Steve, thank you so much uh, for joining us on our naval adventure with the Spanish Armada. Uh, you provided a lot of insights that me and Bjorn could not. Oh, glad you're here. Uh, glad you could join us. Everyone, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you want to write into the podcast, uh, just email us at mondaymorninggeneral at gmail.com, and we will answer your questions or your comments, or we'll take your feedback, whatever you want us to email out to us, and we'll 
read whatever you got to say. Um, and then if you like this episode, go to your podcast player, like and subscribe. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll catch you next time. MMG out.